Hi, this is Charlotte Pierce. I'm the producer of Common Earth. This is our new podcast about conservation, global conservation, and we are here with one of my favorite conservationists, Manoj Gautam. He's in Kathmandu, Nepal. Hi, Manoj. How are you? Hi there. <laughs> yeah, I'm glad we have a good connection. That's awesome. And um, so I'd like to just introduce you a little bit. Um, like I said, I am uh, Charlotte Pierce and piercepress.com is my website. So that's my website. And Manoj has his own uh, website because he's one of my authors for Pierce Press, manojgotam.com. And this whole, uh, the uh, big article he wrote about vulture conservation, our topic today is on that website. It's a really amazing piece, and he'll get into some of the highlights of that. And if we don't have enough time, Manoj, let's just do another um, episode because I know there's a lot to say about it. So, uh, so you were born and brought up in a remote village in Western Nepal, which is what was the name of it? Is the name of it? Uh, it's called Dang. Dang. Yeah, Dang is the district. Yeah. Dang. Yeah. And you grew up in a tight knit community, very much in tune with the natural world around you. Uh, and it was also vulnerable to human wildlife interactions, which is something that you've spent a good portion of your professional life um, nurturing, dealing with, trying to pr improve. Um, you're always passionate about wildlife and all animals. You've read about Dr. Jane Goodall at the age of seven. And ever since, you've pursued the dream of meeting Dr. Goodall. And you did indeed do that in uh, 2005 when she visited Nepal and re responded to one of your uh, your emails. I think, was, was that your e first email or was it a handwritten note? That, you yeah, that was the first ever email. Uh, my first ever email, and that was addressed to Jane. Of course, somebody yeah. else replied to that, and then yeah, and then yeah, I, I love that story. Okay. That's like, <laughs> yeah. And you and were I, 15, 16 then. Um, yeah, some yeah, something mm -hmm. like that. It was at the very early days when uh, email and internet uh, were available, you know, to the general public as a service. Wow, wow. Yeah. Yeah. And then she, uh, you, you became a director of the Jane Goodall Institute of Nepal, and. Uh, had that position for several years, and you've since um, gone to start your own organization in Nepal. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so uh, basically, like you said, you know, like since the age of six or seven, um, since I read about, you know, Jane in a, in a book, I've been trying to follow her, you know, and it wasn't easy back in those days, you know, coming <laughs> from where I, where I come from. Um, there were no television channels like, you know, National Geographic or, you know, Animal Planet, anything like that. I had to lobby late, later, you know, like in many years later, I had to lobby to, to get those from the local, you know, channel subscriber. So, you know, I would, I would just try to follow Jane in, in any means possible. And, uh, like, uh, we discussed earlier, first ever email when I came to Kathmandu for my high school, I sent, uh, to Jane Goodall Institute addressing Jane and of course someone else I replied and then they. Uh, you know, when they found out about you know, about my passion, they offered me um, membership of Roots and Suits, which is a global youth program uh, right. that Jane started. And then I was more than happy to be part of the family. And, uh, and you know, I set it up here in Nepal, became the country coordinator of Roots and Suits uh, and, uh, you know, basically worked on behalf of Roots and Suits for many years before mm -hmm. we thought it was time to, you know, set up Jane Goodall Institute. And then, and then uh, you know, I led the Institute uh, the last year. Um, and yeah. then um, this with the, your colleagues at the Jane Giddle Institute, you got involved in this vulture conservation effort. Is that right? You want to, why vultures? Like, why are they important? They get a bad, I mean, they have a bad uh, connotation. Like you call people vultures and it's not a good thing, but yeah. they are a good thing. What, well, um, to be very honest, I mean, I, I've always been, animal lover you know like always been fascinated by every single living creature you know like uh, good bad and the uglies you know the, even though there's no such thing as good bad and uglies in the in the, in the <laughs> ecological sense but then yeah. we human beings you know have our own preferences uh, very biased um and you know like the biasness i was i was not unique in that regard because um well just flight and you know flying abilities were always uh you know a draw but then 
at the same time, you know, there's something not so very appealing about them because of the, you know, kind of food choices they have. <laughs> food choices, yeah. Uh, but they're, you know, they're, they're, that's a critical thing. It's like our, exactly. no, it's like our precise. sewer system or our, you know, yeah, composting, you know. It's... Absolutely. And, you know, like basically Dang, the district uh, being a massive, uh, you know, the largest actually uh, valley in the region entirely, not just the country, um, uh, used to host, you know, a like, significant population of vultures, uh, because Dang was well populated place, and uh, and because of mm -hmm. the, you know, vast uh, alluvial land mass as well, agricultural land mass, uh, people used to have, uh, you know, many uh, livestock, and unlike in Africa, uh, vultures in Asia they predominantly depend on on cattle livestock because you know once they die they're basically just mm -hmm. disposed of, and then that's where the vultures came in. Uh, and and this trend, you know, the lifestyle of people was also something that was, uh, uh, you know, allowing the vultures to thrive, you know, the population to thrive. Um, and, uh, you know, like, so so having grown in, in Dan, we always, you know, like vultures were all, also part of our culture. There are certain festivals like Tihar, which is upcoming now, uh, during mm -hmm. the main day of Tihar, which is Baitika. Uh, the sisters basically, you know, do some, you know, ritual ceremony. And this uh, is a long-standing thing. This is a very long-standing thing. Yeah, yeah. it's been centuries, centuries old at least. Wow. And more, yeah. more written documentation. So they celebrate person. vultures because they do the cleanup. There are there are a couple of uh, reasons why you know vultures uh, hold uh -huh. you know significance uh, within the either mythology or you know within the, within the religious uh, construct here, and that is because. Uh, and that is because uh, you know there are certain anecdotes in in, in the epic Ramayana where Lord Ram, uh, you know, was uh, supported by you know like actually Goddess Sita who was being abducted by Ravana, the demon. Uh, you know, <laughs> I love uh, these myths. Yeah, in in, in his uh, in his flying, um, I mean, bimana we call it. You know, like mm -hmm. the ancient uh, flying, um, you know, uh, mechanism, whatever that was, flying craft. Yeah. But then yeah. apparently the story uh, goes as uh, the Jatayu, the king of the vulture, actually intercepted and tried to rescue, uh, you know, Mother Sita. But then the Ravana chopped one of his wings, and uh, and he was just, you know, basically left bleeding on the ground. And when uh, Lord Ram tries to, you know, follow the trail, he and you know finds uh, Jatayu, and then Jatayu basically yeah. is the one who tells about, you know, who is the abductor. So that is how you know that that's one reason why uh, you know vultures have a significance in, in, so in our religion. You, you were able to tap into that sort of um, that came later on. Yes, yes, that came in, later on in trying to do this conservation effort, right? Absolutely, because uh, when mm -hmm. we when we uh, and just so tell me, like, for, tell people why exactly. I'm sorry so to interrupt what you, what but was, we started hearing um, about uh, you know significant loss of vulture population. Yeah, yeah. like massive, massive dieback of. Uh, Vultures, and uh, in many cases it was very visible as well. Basically, they were just dropping dead, you know, like re left and right from the trees during the flight uh, in the river bank in Butuol in the nineties, uh, mid nineties. Uh, you know, they were dying out in hundreds, thousands even. Um, and there were several factors actually. Initially, uh, back in early nineties, they were being uh, there was this trend of uh, culling, dog culling. You know, like the the, the stray dog population culling because rabies was a you know big threat. Uh, for public dog health. culling did you say yeah dog culling yeah. So, mm -hmm. because you know dogs uh, street dogs being the vector of rabies uh, virus a uh, fatal disease um you know the, the municipalities did not have any you know better idea about you know how to manage that and they would uh, use strychnine which is a very serious poison oh absolutely um, yeah you know so they would basically just give out uh, meat mm -hmm. pieces laced with uh, strychnine out to the, to the to the dogs and when they die their disposal was not, you know, properly done. You know, they were just basically uh, dumped uh, very openly in the in the riverbank, especially in Butol, which is, uh, you know, uh, central. You could say, you know, central to midwestern, um, somewhere there uh, in that region, uh, a, a thriving city. And in the riverbank of Tinau River, uh, you know, that's when we started noticing the ma massive dieback of uh, vultures. And then came the diclofenac, which was basically a, one of the most efficient i mean we humans use that as well as as one of the most uh, right. efficient that's an agricultural chemical or uh, medicine? This, is, this, is a, this is a pharmaceutical chemical basically it is a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug basically an SID group right drug which is very efficient highly efficient uh, but then uh, for some reason 
uh, you know, it has serious consequences within the Raptors system. And this is all detailed in this article that I just put up the uh, website uh, link. So just if somebody's listening and you didn't understand. Yeah, there's, the there, there's ample, there's ample uh, literature, you know, I'll be, yeah. uh, open literature as well, you know, if, if you just Google mm-hmm. that, you know, like you'll get to see. And then there are later, you know, versions of uh, Dagoponet like, uh, you know, uh, with similar kind of uh, repercussion, um, you know, veterinary drug like ketoprofen and others. Uh, but so what was basically happening was during the advent uh, of the veterinary, because, you know, like people, previously people used to do uh, very domestic uh, remedies, you know, like if their livestock uh, or animals got uh, sick, uh, then, you know, people would just basically use kitchen remedies, we call it, you know, very herbal kitchen remedies. And, uh, you know, advent of 90s, mid 90s, people, uh, you know, the, the livestock service department had these livestock service, uh, you know, units uh, in the village level as well. And that was the uh, the first introduction, you know, to these, to these services to the people. And people, as they started going, one of the most, uh, you know, in a survey that we ran in 2005, shows that at least 80 to 86 percent of the cases that would actually end up in the in the local you know uh, livestock service units would be given either bolus which is the, you know like the, the oral uh, form or, mm-hmm. or injection of diclofenac that's how much prevalent because in any kind of ailment you can imagine there's pain and inflammation is a very common thing and diclofenac being one of the most you know efficient drugs so you can imagine so with, if, with human source and uh, agricultural use well, it's human source would not, yeah, human source would not, because most of the Nepalese people either bury. Uh, I you know, see. Like, okay. Yeah. Okay. So it was a more agricultural. Yeah. 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 It did not human uh, mm-hmm. side of things. Did not have any you know, implication on the vultures. But then, uh, the major food source for vulture, as we discussed earlier, was you know cattle and livestock. And when the livestock die, the livestock don't die immediately. You know, so all of a sudden they go through you know like a certain period of, of illness mm-hmm. or you know. Like, not doing so well during which the treatment happens and most of those would die during the treatment as well so if you can imagine if diclofenac is still in the body system which takes you know like solid few days at least to you know get out of the system if they die during that t- treatment time then the di- diclofenac concentrated form is still in the body and uh, and when they are disposed of vultures you know that were still abundant uh, in number would come and uh, you know uh, basically just clean off the carcass within within 20 30 40 minutes uh, and, and they would come in hundreds of number, and uh, and mm-hmm. that's how they get poisoned. And somehow, uh, diclofenac would cause uh, you know like gout, serious gout, visceral gout, which basically means uh, there would be precipitate of uric right. acid crystals in their liver and kidneys, which would cause very like a severe um, uh, dehydration, you know, and then yeah. they would suffer very slow, painful death you know, because of you know because of uh, dehydration. So that's how so I want to I want to get into just. Uh, in the time we have left, um, yeah. how you worked, you know, like how you brought the awareness to the community and how you worked with the community. And then what happened with the international organizations? So um, when I, when I first heard that they were dying, you know, in that, in that kind of number, then, you know, obviously being a, a conservationist, it was, it was, and I was very fairly young as well, you know, like 19 years or so. I was very much concerned, and then I started uh, going to different you know, organizations that were already working, you know, in, in bird conservation, and shared the, the the idea and concern. And then, when first time I went to uh, Noel Parasi, which is where we ended up, you know, like uh, Noel well, Parasi. That's where you, when I came in uh, 2019, yeah. we went to visit. Yeah. 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 So that was the first ever, you know, Vulture restaurant in, the, in you know, ever basically. That was the first model. And when we first visited there, they were still, you know, like the. the Decent population, you know, even uh, the Egyptian vultures were, you know, quite uh, quite fairly, uh, um, uh, you know, seen or mm-hmm. available, which is which is not the case anymore. Uh, Gyps uh, species majorly were, you know, like uh, abundant still then, even though they, it was, you know, like a very critical time already for vultures. But Nolprasi being a, a very favorable uh, place, you know, for 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 vulture for various reasons, habitat wise and also, you know, food availability wise. When I first went there, that's when I got to see this. You know, there's this vulture, uh, Gidda Kola, they call it, which basically means vulture river. And they also Gidda call it Gidda Kola. Gidda is vulture in the place, and Kola is, is, is a stream or like a creek or a river. Oh, I remember and that when we were driving around, you don't know, see these road signs that says Kola. And exactly. it's a stream. Yes. Yeah, yes. you still remember. I'm amazed. I uh, remember. Okay. So. so uh, that's the benefit but at of, this you know, time, just to, to clarify, uh, this time, the vultures were still doing okay, but it was obvious that they were uh, in under. No, uh, vultures were not doing okay. Actually, the vultures oh, had I already see. 
gone through a significant decline and you I know the, die, the dieback was you know it's still happening it was all still ongoing because diclofenac was still out there you know at large and but the, but the but Noel Brasi still had solid population of vultures you know like as compared to any other place that that I knew of at least uh, you know it was one of the very few places left where uh, you could you know you could just basically make a trip and then would see vultures in, you know, immediately almost immediately soaring which used to be the case in uh, entirely throughout the length of the country, you know, whether it's Himalayas, mid hills, lower hills, or the the, the southern plains. Uh, but then, you know, by this time, around 2005, 2004, 2005, you know, they were fairly limited to certain, you know, uh, pocket areas, and Noel Brasi wow. was one of the prime. Areas. Was there was there an awareness among the villagers or the people? No, no, no. This, this was very early on, you know, other than a very few experts and you know, like uh, leading organizations. Uh, there weren't, you know, like it wasn't, uh, it wasn't a, a, you know, public knowledge. Uh, I mean, of course, you know, like their own indigenous knowledge and their own observation, you know, was there because yeah. it, you know, the decline was significant. And you know, it's it, one thing that, that people do not appreciate or you know, like comprehend about the about the magnitude of availability of vultures. They were in millions. You know, they were in millions in South Asian, you know, continent, Indian subcontinent. Uh, you know, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, uh, uh, Nepal, you know, included, and. So, you know, like something that used to be always there, available, soaring, you know, you just look up here, horizon to horizon, yeah. and you yeah. would not miss, you know, these birds. Uh, and all of a sudden, they were just gone and, you know, limited in certain areas. And you know what the indicators were? The carcasses now would just be rotting for days and weeks even sometimes, you know, like allowing serious manifestation of, like, insect manifestations, uh, jackal and street So dog. other uh, related problems grew up from this. Absolutely. And that yeah. is exactly why vulture, why vulture, more than anything else, you know, because we, uh, you know, when we were little kids, since we were little kids, and you as well, actually, you know, we've always uh, read books, you know, we've, we've been taught about the web of life, right? The ecology, mm -hmm. how it works. There isn't any other species that I have found in my, you know, entire professional life, or personal life as well, that is so distinctively uh, efficient example that you know that that so efficiently explains the the idea of you know how this this uh, you know uh, ecological web works and how each and every single you know like we keep saying this each and every single species is you know uh, has significance but vultures were that one species that uh, really you know one could read one could read that you know if if they don't uh, exist anymore then then catastrophe public health especially you know catastrophe could happen it was such an ex you know, such a strong example because bubonic plague outbreak uh, was going you know like really nuts in india um, anthrax you know was massive 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 threat uh, that was you know breaking out wow. here and there in, in, in many places and mm -hmm. also uh, rabies you know because it was allowing like when the vultures don't come and clean up entire you know 600 pound carcass in in few minutes time 20 30 minutes time then they would be basically festering for for days and days which you know attracts all different sorts of uh, vectors and agents like uh, yeah. street dogs, jackals, and mongoose and and rats and whatnot, shrews and you know all, all different sort of uh, creatures, and that's where these you know the vector, well, the, the, the the agents uh, you know, our pathogens are uh, basically exchanged, and and this is what makes vultures very clearly and visibly and very comprehensibly one of the most efficient. Uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Isn't work of, uh, of, the, of the environment. Is the that reason is they exist, isn't there? <laughs> absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. So that well, is. Uh, let me ask you. Uh, was I going to ask you? Oh, just the transition to um, the, the actual vulture restaurant, which was an original idea that you and your colleagues came up with in collaboration with the community of yeah. Noah Parasi. Right? Am I right so far? Yes. Yes. Okay. And. Uh, so what is a vulture restaurant? And remember you told me this before I even went over there. You know, like you said, I, I said, what vulture restaurant? What are you feeding the vultures? So when, 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 when we when we use this term vulture restaurant, you know, the general sentiment that you know it hits people with is, uh, it, you know, like if the people people related the nearest thing people can relate it with like seafood restaurant or something like that. <laughs> it's not a <laughs> Do restaurant where you eat you? vultures. <laughs> But it was simply, you know, it was a very naively put in, uh, put out term. But, but it's a restaurant. You were bringing uh, clean carcasses, right? It, it it is basically the restaurant for the vultures because, uh, like we discussed earlier, the only food source was contaminated, and that is why you know uh, vultures yeah. were dying out in, in massive number, almost ninety eight point, you know, like five percent 
uh, declination in, in 10, 11 years time. That is the one of the sharpest, you know, like uh, population declination ever recorded in natural history uh, of a bird that was so abundant. So what we did, the idea was basically we would make sure that uh, two things majorly. One was uh, that the food uh, was available because also you know, another, another crisis was that uh, people's behavior were changing. Uh, the, the land use was changing seriously and then people's uh, tendency to keep livestock, you know, the livestock number were degrading, which is what was compromising the food availability. But then uh, the only source of food was poisoned as well. So uh, the Vulture restaurant was one short answer to, to both the concerns. That was to make the, you know, make sure that food is available for them and to make sure that only safe food is available to them. So the general idea was we just went uh, around, you know, like miking, talking to people, pamphleting around in the entire, you know, like villages uh, and then let people know that, guys, if your, uh, you know, livestock dies, then let us know. Because, yeah. you know, like it's, it's quite and a they scene. Did, they did that? They did, they actually they did. did that, of course, because it was, it would be quite a situation for people to deal with a dead carcass in their, in their, in their cow shed, you know, like they would have to carry it and then you know find a tractor or something like that and what we did was we assisted them in the beginning yeah. we told them call us and we'll help you and in return what we did every time we started getting calls you know we, we would go attend the you know call and then we would basically interrogate them you know what was the cause of the death if, if so found you nasty. tested the the animals or did you just uh-huh yeah, I mean, it, we we didn't have means for like chemical analysis and you know like all that kind of razzle dazzle thing, but it was it was it, because it was very simple village uh, setup, so it wasn't that right, difficult right, to right. Know, figure out you know what was the cause of the death. Uh, we would also you know look for the medical you know history or anything like that. And in in case it was poisoned or if, in in case it was contaminated, we made sure that it's buried and it's it's out of the you know uh, access of ours. Otherwise, we would just basically uh, take it to the to this platform, which was the Vulture restaurant, and then uh, there was another guy who would uh, who we had partner the the skin dealing guy. Um, and he, he would basically just uh, deal with the hide, open it, and then make it easy for the for the vultures. And he would sell this hide for uh, about six dollars. He would take three three dollars. He would give us three dollars, and that three dollars would uh, would be used to you know further attend another call. So that is how we know. And and, and the it's local just company, like little steps, but in a constant you know more sustainable, way, more sustainable yeah. way, financially sustainable, energy wise sustainable. It made sense because it, there was already need. For people to dispose of their carcass, and and all they needed to do was do it in a in a manner that's safe for the vultures. We, it's a win-win, and, and they understood that. And you know, that, and were that, you working uh, with the government at this point, or or the uh, yeah, local well, community? Well, or... Initially, very initially, it was the it was the local people, which was not very easy to convince them because you know, like the, culturally, again, we talked about yeah. religious earlier, but then culturally, it was also a challenge because people, uh, vultures were not very liked by by the you know by the local people because they eat cows, and cows are holy. You know, yeah, so oh, I see. eating dirty. If a vulture roosts on your rooftop, then you have to basically, you know, like break all the all the floors. You know, like a, a hole that's about you know one foot by one foot kind of thing, all the way to the place where the vultures had roosted, and then organize a very expensive puja. You know, like this ritual thing. Sure. And nobody yeah. wanted that, so people would shoo these vultures away. You know, and that's why it would not let any big simul tree, very highly preferred tree, yeah. by you know vultures. And from that to, you know, using this religious sentiments, using the ecological, you know, uh, logic, uh, we, we had to work hard. But then the, the, the community got it, you know, and they were yeah. absolutely on board. And slowly their identity, this is a small little village of Basa Basai. Started I remember getting, you uh, telling me about that. Happened. Yeah, Exactly. You've been there. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, an entire village became uh, like uh, my, my little, you know, my second family. And then we would work day and night, you know, uh, discuss, plan. And that's how uh, that's how it it, it uh, went into a whole another level and got that recognition of being the vulture capital. Of but the municipal or the regional conservation authorities were they on board with this as well? Or so I mean, you know, it was just a it, it was just a very in initial phase, and then came you know uh, there was a bird conservation Nepal, uh, big you know ornithological uh, leading organization, and then uh, they basically replicated the idea uh, you know in Pitoli, which still goes on. They did it uh, in many other places as well. Some of them are still sort of working. Many of them are not uh, working, unfortunately. But the idea was replicated. The idea has been replicated in many other countries as well. You know, something that mm -hmm. started in, you know, you know, from a 19 years old mind and you know, like a, in a little <laughs> village uh, with with little you know community support, uh, has now become you know like a beacon in the field of conservation, yeah. which gives us an immense satisfaction. And uh, and then you know, like rest is history, basically. Because yeah. uh, that, that and until the date, actually, till the date, you know, there have been so many, you know, like millions of dollars of investment in breeding programs and this and that research, research, research. But there is hardly anything that is uh, that has yielded more than 
Yeah, the mm-hmm. concept, the simple concept of uh, of uh, Valsa Restaurant. And in the initial days, even the experts would like kind of discredit this. This this was this is my personal experience of based mm-hmm. on uh, personal discussion with so them. So they didn't give credit to the sort of organic. Well, obviously, obviously yeah. we didn't get the credit uh, because mm-hmm. the credit was bagged by so many. You know, like oh. there, there were always new people popping up uh, claiming that that's not that that's not what matters though. You know, like as long as. Uh, but do you, you feel know, like the idea has? Absolutely. Improved. The idea has uh, gotten uh, credential as an efficient idea. There's no doubt about it. Perfect. Uh, yeah. Which is why they are, you know, like popping up figures, people claiming this idea that, you know, uh, as if, you know, they came up with it. Which is, you know, mm-hmm. like you know, there's no contest here as long yeah. as they do it in, in, in real terms. But then mm-hmm. at the same time, there are so many other, you know, distractions. Like I said, you know, people discredit uh, experts in the very initial phase would try to discredit it, saying, like, yeah, but the success is only, you know, like uh, in, in, in very limited in pocket areas. Of course, you know, like because these are pocket initiatives, you know, like why not replicate this and you know and make it make it wider rather than stealing wild breeding pairs from the wild, you know, like uh, and and bringing them in little enclosures, you know, and then which so was the breeding program? It extracted breeding pairs from the wild, absolutely, and then they weren't there to create a wild population, right? So, they still aren't, and you know, like the yeah. very little insignificant uh, number since then, yeah. since two thousand eight onwards, have been you know released back in the wild despite the you yeah. know like immense. Uh, expenses and this and that and also in situ situation if you if you, if you don't improve the in situ situation i mean we have see this is the thing you know like we we replicate we copy because things are sexy and glamorous which is i believe you know the, the, this breeding uh, program was uh, copied from californian condors experience but then exactly, one, one, yeah. one of the major uh, things that we know from californian condors was that was the lead poisoning you know among the among the hunted and shot animals uh, is that you know if you, if you cannot sort out the in situ situation then there's no point in reintroduction uh, reintroducing the, the the captive bred ones because they will not be able to survive same reason why the you know uh, millions and millions of uh, of, uh, of, the, of the population of the vultures many species of vultures died uh, at the first place you know so there's yeah. no point in, in in focusing on breeding and reintroduction if you cannot sort out the in situ situation so my focus has always been to you know uh, in in the ground in the real ground in the real habitat where we need to, you know, uh, take the threats away from the real ground, from the real habitat, right. rather than putting on, on somewhere so, else. There's no point in making uh, balls of, you know, like feathers and bones and and, and, and meat. We need <laughs> efficient scavengers, you know, like uh, mm-hmm. that can, you know, play the role of nasal sanitizer. So we have a couple of minutes left. Um, I just wanted to ask you where this effort is now and where you are placing your emphasis in conservation in Nepal or elsewhere? Yeah, one thing that happens is, you know, like this is this is uh, why I wrote the the, the article recently, because what happened was Basa Basai was very unfairly, you know, uh, robbed from the credit that they deserve, you know, because it took away that natural enthusiasm, you know, like their their sense of pride. It's like, what the heck? Where is that? Exactly. Because in 2010, when we organized that uh, first, uh, you know, Vulture Conservation Festival, it saw, I mean, in a place where barely anybody, you know, visited, it saw a mass participation of more than 18,000 people gathered in one place, you know, for three or five days, the entire villages, you know, like not only Basa, and there was a little rift between Basa and Basai village, both came together, you know, like work hand in hand in celebrating, you know, Vulture's uh, conservation awareness. Um, yeah. And it, it was a massive celebration to, uh, you know, sitting ministers visited. And, you know, that's how... That's how the enthusiasm, we had worked so hard on, you know, increasing the enthusiasm among the lo- local people. Hundreds of women and men, you know, participated in it spontaneously. And when they don't, when, when you rob that kind of credential from them, then that can, that can kind of, you know, like lower the motivation. And, uh, and that's ex- exactly what happened, you know. So we saw, you know, like a, like a drop yeah. in, in, in. They uh, just said, well, what exactly. happened to our initiative? Yeah, exactly. So. That that foul playing is also something that uh, I, I would like to you know bring uh, into people's attention and, sure. and concern you know, bodies uh, bodies attention because one, one you know my idea about conservation is that may, many times it is possible M- many other times it might not be possible desperate times desperate measures but most of the time the conservation is very much dependent on lifestyle of people you know if people abide by certain lifestyle mm-hmm. then you know conservation becomes a, a part of you know part of lifestyle you know conservation is is nothing but the byproduct of a responsible living. If people, you know, choose not to uh, abide by that, then you know there's there's a crisis. And rather than turning uh, conservation into an exotic foreign business, you know, fed by dollars from somewhere else, which is necessary at times, and I admit that, yeah, we do, yeah, mm-hmm. we all do that. But then 
as far as possible. Why don't we try to keep it grounded? You know, why don't we try to keep it grounded, make it as less uh, laborious, you know, labor extensive as possible, and and you know, use our creativity and strategic manners to somehow entwine you know people's mm -hmm. lifestyle with, like we did, you know, like and again, in in many other versions of now, you know, like current day uh, Vulture Restaurant, you will see people gathering, hoarding, you know, street animals from here, there, keeping them for ages, you know, feeding hay where they don't, you know, like often get to have an access to green grass or anything like that. Almost like killing uh, livestock for vultures, which is more expensive, laborious, <laughs> this, you know, like, mm -hmm. it, it, and limited as well. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you, if you tap onto the natural resource, that natural source of the carcasses, you know, which is the, the, the general villages, basically, you know, people's lives, uh, you know, households, then there's no limit. Limit yeah. is the number of the livestock. You know, it's, it's got a limited. solid foundation. Yeah. Exactly. And well, that's that, 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 yeah. really, really, you know, less labor and, and cost uh, effective, less uh, labor intensive and co very cost, cost effective. Uh, and which is why now, after all these many years of gap, uh, because, you know, I was all over the place in Oxford, you know, I had to, you know, continue my further mm -hmm. studies and consolidate my ideas and, and approach as well. Now, what we're doing is we're working together with the local government because now post federalism, you know, Nepal has recently gone into uh, federalism, the, the power devolution and, you know, power decentralization has, has uh, you know, kind of been realized to its uh, truest meaning. And the local municipal uh, entities are also more aware about conservation and this and that good, so good. we're trying to yeah. work with them and spread it out and yeah. again reinforce the idea of uh, of Balsa restaurant and uh, you know make the best of it well i um, think uh next time you come on i'd like to talk about that community-based conservation concept that you have done extensive field research and other types of research and thought on so i think it's just absolutely. i think it's the future of conservation and you know preservation of our species and our planet so you know because we live here too you know <laughs> exactly I mean, yeah. yeah so thank you and so we, much we and um, because of the services that you know these amazing creatures like well just uh provide you know? yeah 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 well in, in uh we are a little bit over but can you come back in a, a couple of weeks and we'll continue the absolutely. conversation I would love to. Yeah, absolutely right. let's continue i'm yeah. so happy thank you manaj and yeah, uh, all the way from Kathmandu absolutely to the ends of the earth <laughs> <laughs> take care bye this is charlotte yeah. pierce and manaj gotam coming at you from boston and nepal bye Cheers.